All right. So hi, everyone. Thanks for a warm introduction. Um, let me just quickly. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm Jan. I am developer advocate at Superface. And well, I used to put uh, my Twitter handle at these introductory uh, slides, but I think it's not the best idea uh, in these days. So uh, instead, if you would like to get in touch with me, uh, there's my a link to my old school website website. Anyway, what we do at Superface is that we help developers to integrate APIs. And what we are learning is that the most expensive part of API integrations isn't decoding uh, or like the programming or figuring out how to connect the SDK, but it's the analysis, like understanding how the API works and how to use it. So today, I'm going to talk about APIs from developers' perspective, how developers perceive your API and what you can do to help them. And for this talk, I will play a role of a clueless developer, which is something I'm very good at. And I will treat you, my audience, as API providers, so regardless whether you already have some partner or public API or just thinking about building uh, one. And for a start, let me ask you a question. Why should I use your API? Just like in your head, think about it for a bit. Maybe your API is the only one in the world uh, to provide like unique solution, or maybe developers don't have any other choice because uh, like management tells them like it's the only API can, they can use to solve their problem. But that's, I think it's also part of the answer because uh, I think it boils down to the fact that your API solves some problem, maybe not directly for the developer, but for the company uh, which is using it. And, but when I put it that way, it's sort of very generic answer. Uh, like I don't expect your API to do my laundry, for example. Uh, so to put it in more concrete terms, I will use uh, your API to fulfill use case for my application. And what I mean by use case here is a scenario where your API is useful uh, to implement some particular feature in my application. Consider, let me give you an example. Consider this scenario. I'm building a user registration system with stuff like login, sign up, and also password reset. That's my use case. Now, as I'm thinking about this feature, I figure out, yeah, I will need to send some password reset email with a link for the user. And so now I, I try to figure out how I can send in an email with my text stack. Uh, so I will look for some email API providers. I will probably find this provider and they call it sim simple email service. So I, it should be simple, right? Uh, but then they talk about stuff like flexible deployment options, which sounds neat, but like nothing about password resets. So I will research further, further and maybe I will find SendGrid and they tell me we can send transactional emails. Uh, what are transactional emails, I ask. And on their solutions pages, they show me how transactional emails are used, including password reset emails. They also give me a ready-made example with email template. And so I know that's the right service for me. And maybe I end up using SendGrid for building this particular feature. So to break it down, my use case was to build a password reset feature. And I figured out that what I am looking for is transactional emails. Um, so as a developer, I am trying to match my use case uh, with some features of APIs or specifically their capabilities what these APIs offer. Uh, and in our experience, this is also the hard part about understanding APIs. Uh, I think about my use case in my language while you as a provider present your capabilities in your terminology. And usually I'm not an expert in your domain, which is why I need to use your API in the first place. So as a developer, I need to map my use case to your capabilities, translate the terminology and data structures and understand all the flows and processes. And that's usually the part which takes us the most time when we deal with an API where we don't understand the problem domain. 
Let me give you another, maybe more convoluted example. Say, I want to know how my open source project is doing and the metric of popularity on GitHub and GitLab are stars, right? So I want to know who gives a star to my project. And I want to know that both on GitHub and GitLab, just to make it interesting. So I will look into documentation for each of these platforms and I will start with GitHub. And there I learned that each repository has stargazers, uh, which is how GitHub calls people who gave a star to the repository. Um, and so I understand the concepts and I can translate them to my own. And then I need to decide whether I will use their REST or GraphQL API uh, to translate my use case to API calls. Now let's take a look at GitLab. While GitLab has a concept of repository, it's a different than GitHub's. Instead, the equivalent concept is called project, and it has starters instead of stargazers. So I need to understand these differences. And again, GitLab has both REST and GraphQL API. So I will need to decide which one to use. And I should rather hope that both of these APIs provide the same features because it, it isn't always the case. Uh, so as developers, we have to do a lot of mapping when integrating an API. First, we need to understand the concepts and the domain of the API. And when we need to translate our use case to specific API calls. And beside that, we need to also understand business rules, things like what's the pricing structure? Uh, is it like per call or something else? Uh, what are the rate limits? Should I throttle my API calls? What authentication scopes I need? Or how API changes are announced and handled? So that's a lot of stuff um, I need to do as a developer. I need to cover and understand. I need to understand the problem domain of your API, the terminology, processes, flows. I need to understand the business rules of your API to know what happens as my usage increases and what's the impact on long-term maintenance of the integration. I need to figure out what your API offers, uh, its features and capabilities, and which are relevant to me. And finally, uh, I need to translate my use cases to the capabilities of your API. So it's a lot of things. Now, what you, you as API providers should do to make integration easier for developers? Well, you could try treat your API as a product, uh, including uh, having a dedicated product owner. And now maybe this sounds pretty obvious to some or most of you, and I really hope so. But from my experience and even from conversations I had with different companies, it's still usual to treat APIs as something you just toss behind the wall and let external developers to have fun with it. Like, we don't care, just like, here you go. And many companies treat APIs as sort of like secondary feature with no oversight and no quality control. So if you can appoint a dedicated person uh, to be responsible for your API, uh, it is should be some API product owner. And one of the responsibilities of a product owner is to understand the users and their needs, which in case of APIs also includes uh, how to understand understanding of uh, the developer's domain was the context in which they will use your API. In other words, API product owners should understand and discover use cases of your users. And well, where else to start than with user research? Uh, just ask developers who use your API, or if you don't have an API yet, hopefully you have some partners asking about it. Maybe they would be interested in using some a your API of yours. Uh, but just keep in mind when doing a user research uh, with developers about technical stuff, we really like to tell you about our technology preferences and like, our favorite uh, things, but especially during the use case discovery, you should rather focus on understanding the problem domain of uh, the developers, of the users. Uh, so learn more about what they are building. Uh, 
There's no shame in researching competition. So if there are competitor, competitors in your domain, maybe take a look at what they are doing with their API. Uh, but before you jump into just like blindly, blindly copy, copying their documentation and APIs, maybe think if you can improve it. Maybe you can simplify, simplify the terminology, or maybe you can simplify some processes and flows, for example, if I need to do multiple calls to your uh, to competitors API to achieve my goal, maybe I could do it just like with a single call in your API. And my favorite complementary approach uh, in use cases discovery is to look at the code to see how APIs are used in the world in the wild. So you can start by entering your company name or uh, URL of your API into GitHub search and. Maybe you will be surprised uh, what you can what you will find if you didn't do that yet. Also, uh, GitHub repositories uh, can be organized into topics by their authors, uh, which can be helpful for better understanding of uh, domain of the users and domain where your API is, is used. In some domains with multiple API providers doing the same things, like cryptocurrency exchanges or geolocation in these particular examples, uh, there are popular what I call multi-provider SDKs, which implement the same interface over multiple APIs. And if this is relevant for your domain, maybe take a look at how these SDKs are used and whether it's something maybe you could sort of like acknowledge and recommend to your users. Uh, and speaking of usage, you can check uh, the dependency graph for every project on GitHub. Uh, this can be really use useful to see how your competitors uh, or, or your uh, SDK is used in various projects. Also, uh, developers love to collect these uh, awesome lists around various topics like platforms, programming languages, and particular problem domains. Uh, and this can be really helpful to learn what other libraries or APIs your users use in addition to your API. Now, when you have better idea uh, where your API can be used, uh, you should tell me about it. Here, I have a few examples how API use cases can be presented. So many developer-oriented companies have a section uh, called solution on their uh, website. Here's an example from Stripe where solutions are categorized by most common groups of their users like SaaS companies, e-commerce, or crypto. And when I look at e-commerce solutions, I can see how their products can be relevant for my use case. Uh, however, these websites are typically full of fluffy marketing language, so I like to go straight for the documentation. What will you show me there? Well, Stripe is doing pretty well. They guide me straight to their most popular product uh, payments, and they clearly explain how their products are uh, used and how they could be relevant to. But in contrast, what I usually find is that uh, documentation is very product-centered, uh, where each API and even each version of an API uh, is a separate product. Here's an example from here.com, and well, I'm no geolocation expert. So if I would like to build a routing feature in my application, uh, I don't have any idea what's the difference between routing API, Isolan routing API, or Matrix routing API. But perhaps you do. Uh, something to include in your documentation are use case guides uh, as a basic navigation to help developers uh, to understand your API. Uh, for example, Muse uh, is a cloud-based hospitality system for property management, and their API is quite complex and abstract, but they have these uh, use case guides for common scenarios their API is used for. Uh, and these uh, use case guides explain common flows, and they point me to parts of uh, the API relevant for my use case. And finally, uh, use case tutorials can be very useful for new developers. But here's a catch. As Adam Duvender from Every Developer points out, many times documentation covers product tutorials focused on particular features of your API or product. 
while what we should look for are use case tutorials. And Adam gives this example from Twilio. Uh, their documentation includes appointment reminders as a use case tutorial, while most other tutorials teach developers how to use features of Twilio's API. Uh, GitHub includes this tutorial on how to build a CI server in Ruby with their status API and webhooks. And instead of telling me some theory of the API and giving me endpoint references, they just show me a code I can learn from and adjust for my use case. Third example is from Vonage, a Twilio competitor. Uh, and they went even further. They give me a fully working uh, contact center code and instructions how to run it. But maybe that can be too much because uh, now I need to study someone else's code, which is honestly less fun than writing the code. Now, um, to tie it together, uh, how we can apply use cases in the API design. Now, whether you are building or revising your API, maybe start with user research and use cases discovery. Uh, this should give you a better idea of real-world use cases for your API. Uh, technology, technological decisions should come after that, like what sort of API makes sense for the for these use cases? Should I like build like a typical REST API, or maybe use GraphQL, or maybe even use SOAP because my users are familiar with that? Then the choice of technology informs also how you will design your API. Uh, and if you follow the design first approach, you will create a specification, uh, for example, open API document first, which will help you test you your implementation. And also you can use it to build and test guides and tutorials, even without building your API, because if you have well-written specification, you can just mock the API and maybe even test those, those guides and tutorials with your, with your users. So to tie this up, um, to return back to the title of my, uh, my talk, why your API doesn't solve my problem? Well, usually it's because I can't understand it. And typically uh, what uh, you will present to me in the documentation are references of, of say endpoints or data models, or you give me product tutorials and maybe even you give me open API specification, which is everything that's great to understand the capabilities of your API. And I like to think of these things as a map. It's, uh, it gives me some idea where I can go with the API, uh, but it's upon me to find my way around uh, the API. Now, solutions and guides uh, explaining use cases uh, can act as sort of like turn-by-turn -turn navigation. They tell me how I can fulfill my use case, how to get to my goal. Uh, and if you also give me a use case tutorial, it's like sort of giving me a vehicle to get faster towards my goal. And these three classes, artifacts, uh, references, use case guides, solutions, and use case tutorials, it's not like they each is better than the other one. They complement each other and uh, like really to fully grasp your API. Um, I will start, for example, from tutorials to get some understanding of your API. And usually I will get so familiar that I will just like look at the reference and know exactly what I need. But uh, if you think like building all this stuff is sounds like a hard work, well, I totally agree with you. Uh, just like imagine if you could give uh, your you get your users straight to the solution without like them studying the navigation, uh, studying the documentation, uh, sort of like self-driving car for an APIs. Well. That's what we call autonomous integration, and it's what we are building at superface.ai, but that's topic for another time. Um, check us out at superface.ai if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, here's again my website, and I will be happy uh, to take uh, questions now. Thank you, Jan.
where do you um where do you as the developer advocate come in i mean what state of realizing that we need external help are you being called in well uh we usually work with uh startups who uh, need a lot of integrations so i am just like one of uh, well i'm sort of with my with my colleague uh, we are more like uh, customer success engineers trying to understand the needs uh, of those companies which need to integrate and uh so it's typically like yeah we know that we have this long roadmap of ahead of us with a lot of integrations but we have no idea how to how to integrate them so um, my role is usually to give them some basics, like what's the, what they need uh, for integrating, how they, for example, should read access tokens, authorization flows, and stuff like that. And then we jump, jump to uh, give them like ready-made use cases to integrations for, uh, for their product. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And... Um... I might be wrong, but what you call a use case tutorial, would that be what we could also call a work example, or that's something else? Still? Uh, come again. Uh, um, would that would the expression "worked example" work, that work the, example, work uh, example, like a worked out example, would be the same as a use case tutorial? Like I think it, the issue here's how we solved it and why. Like put the thing into context. Would that be the same? Uh, I am not familiar with the term. I use uh, use case tutorial as something mm -hmm. what I have learned from Adam Duvender, uh, but it's very possible. It's very similar. I think what's characteristic of uh, use case tutorials, or in particular the example uh, I gave from Twilio, is that they give you sort of like step by step uh, example in building uh, the towards the use case. So mm -hmm. so. Uh, it's, for example, I think it's also like the difference uh, between uh, Twilio and Vonage in my presentation. Oh, I'm locked out. Uh, because uh, Vonage, they give me like something which is already done for me. Uh, so maybe it's closer to the worked example you mentioned. Uh, but again, it's th these like samples or code samples tend to be more complex. Um, but uh, these tutorials, on the other hand, uh, they usually work from the from the developer's context. So they, for example, use popular um, popular server frameworks uh, and languages, and uh, they also use, for example, something for database. And they take me like step by step uh, through towards building that uh, particular feature. Uh, so yeah, I probably didn't answer your question, but mm -hmm, hopefully did. it yes. better explains my, my thinking behind behind use case tutorials. So um, from the audience, you are getting the uh, appreciation that this is um, very helpful and, and giving the confidence to keep walking the path that they are walking. When I see your presentation, obviously I work in this space, um, but it seems, um, Yes, of course we should do this. And I, I assume that you also think like, why is this even a question? Yeah. That it should be done like this. But because you are called into the problematic spaces, where is that invisible wall that is so hard to cross? Even though in theory, the people that work with this know that this is how it should be. Of course, they are also users with some other APIs. What is so hard? I think... Um... I think it's the overall culture about around APIs, and I think it's something which is slowly changing. I believe that you are sort of also at the frontier of these changes, but it sort of connects with the product API product owner thing I mentioned, uh, because um, from my experience, even from working uh, previously in SaaS company, they had an API, but uh, and they had even like dedicated team working on that, but they treat it as more like technical artifact, you know, like mm -hmm. we need to do references for individual endpoints, but uh, they, because usually developers are charged with building those APIs, uh, they usually don't focus too much on like the other 
side of the the, the, the user's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I think the invisible wall or like the the obstacle here is uh, like trying to bring more say human aspect to to APIs to treat them as something like what in the end like people will be using. Like we are actually trying to remove this human factor from those integrations because we think like developers can do better things than to just like study documentation and um, like focus on their problems and maybe it should be computers who will figure out like how we should like connect tie those applications together but uh, yeah like currently i think what the best we can do is to like perceive the needs of of the developers and the users so really try to try to bring a different perspective into into like writing your documentation designing your api mm -hmm. How much behavioral driven development makes sense in API development while being use case driven? Are these two behavioral driven design and use case driven development the same? That's a really interesting question. So uh, behavioral driven development, uh, if I understand it correctly, those are things like, for example, Gherkin, uh, right? Uh, uh, where where you which is really helpful uh, for establishing your domain language i think it could be tied together uh you could sort of re rewrite those use cases into user stories uh, provide a perspective and uh, use those user stories or these scenarios uh, for validating uh, that use case so i think absolutely uh, to have these artifacts, uh, to have them prepared based on your user research, uh, that's like really, really useful uh, approach, I think. So, um, and next question: How would you differentiate between guides and tutorials? Um, mm -hmm. You sort of explained that, but maybe would you? Uh... Yeah, let's let's uh, because because that's something. So, um, how I uh, use cases? Um, sorry. So guides, for example, from the that example I gave from um, news, uh, there are more uh, abstract, at least like based on these examples I'm giving. Maybe this terminology can be a little bit fuzzy. So if you call these things differently, uh, I don't have like a total authority over that. So uh, your mileage may vary, as Americans say. But uh, in these particular examples I gave, uh, news uh, use case guides uh, focus on uh, like API references and API resources which are relevant to build uh, those particular uh, uh, products for example they have they they because because they are in hospitality sector they deal with companies building like check-in kiosks or points of sales or accounting uh, and they need to support them to integrate with their API to get these data they need. So uh, I really recommend to check out their connector API uh, to get better understanding of that. But uh, it boils down to the fact that they give developers like step-by-step -step guide. You need to use this endpoint. You need to first load configuration. Then whenever you want to uh, when, for example, when the user wants to check in, you will call this endpoint. So it's more more on the explaining how the API works, how are the uh, individual flows structured through the API. Is on the other hand, where you sorry. would the data model and the domain model. Mm, I think, yeah, I think I think that they, uh, the the domain domain model is. I mean they. In, in their example, they are more linking to API to relevant references in their API of their API. So the domain model is more explained on uh, that side or data model. But uh, yeah, it's focused mostly on flows. Like these are the API endpoints you need to use to build that particular uh, feature. Uh, on the other hand, the tutorials uh, are, I would say they are more hands on. Uh, like with the example of Twilio, you can see that they let you choose a particular uh, language, text stack, and they take you uh, step by step uh, 
So maybe it's even more approachable for um, like junior developers who are still kind of under learning their way, around, their way around APIs and understanding like how even I should use an API. Uh, so yeah, I would say it's really about like being like a hands-on tutorial uh, which guides me step by step. And I, I think it's even more difficult to build like a good use case tutorial uh, than to explain an overview uh, mm -hmm. like like of your API. So be prepared to probably spend more resources on that. Mm -hmm. Last question. This is kind of my pet peeve, seeing how I'm, you know, I'm an immigrant to Belgium from Hungary. So I'm really keen on translation, please. Um, do you also give advice on um, what to translate, what not to translate? This also came up at the Deaf Portal Awards. Which which parts of this whole documentation do you start translating? Some of it is changing too fast. The translation cannot keep up, but it would be lovely if it was translated. Do you, do you give advice on this? Well, you mean like localization or? Uh, not just, I don't necessarily mean localization to uh, the local regulations because that's a separate problem, but um, really linguistic translation oh. as in not English. Yeah, that's a really good uh, question. And I don't have any opinion on that because, uh, well, I like we, we are not like, uh, us based company we are like based in czech republic and uh, we treat english as like the primary language so um the translation or linguistic translation for us uh it's something yeah i i'm not sure if i can understand this okay. I was I did, uh, uh, answer this question well yeah <laughs> I was because you were uh, so what's the difference between guide and tutorials and I was interested oh yeah come back to oh, that so so more, more about like the terminology mm -hmm. no, which because it is hard to build it and then once you once you build this oh, once yeah. you wrote this it has to be kept up to date because otherwise you're doing more harm than good right and if that, you need to right, maintain yeah. this in more languages you might even do more harm so Precisely, what yeah. is the point of good versus you can mislead people this was the question so i think i think if you have like well established your use cases it can actually help you uh, with the maintenance because uh i believe or we believe actually from superface for a point of view uh that like understanding your users domain and giving them something which it, it's sort of like sort of like uh your guide light something you can uh, refer to uh, as you are uh, further iterating on your API and maybe you could like check on, yeah, does it like these further iterations make sense uh, for, for these use cases? So um, I think, I think like well-established use cases are something which is worth of translating once you sort of st stabilize your API around those use cases. Mm -hmm. So, so then, uh, then it can also help you help you, for example, to see if, uh, for example, those API changes uh, you plan could hurt some particular use cases. Maybe it's an acceptable trade-off for you. Uh, but yeah, and I think actually the behavior-driven development mentioned by uh, mentioned uh, Anit. by Anit, yeah, uh, is something which could you help you uh, could help you actually to keep those. Uh, your documentation in check because uh, because like if you have uh, ideally like end to end tests on uh, driven through the behavioral driven development um, then you could even see if those flows described in your guides your tutorials still sort of match the reality of your api mm -hmm. so yeah Thank you for thinking Thank on you. the spot. <laughs> Sorry for putting you in there. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, and I'm looking forward to how this keeps playing.